Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Horus Heresy Law Breakdowns. We are now on book number seven, Legion, written by Dan Abnett. And this book is about everybody's favorite Astartes Legion, the Meme Legion. See, the Alpha Legion is, on one hand, a very, very, very interesting and cool Legion because there is so much mystery around them, and yet there's also a fair bit of stuff we know for certain. We know just enough to intrigue us into wanting to know more, and they are very, very unique in that they are probably, even in modern 40k, still loyalists. The problem is, the Alpha Legion is a very, very delicate tool of storytelling. If you don't give them enough mystique, then they kind of come across as disappointing because, you know, they're the Alpha Legion. But on the other hand, if you give them too much mystique and do nothing but write in dozens of complete 180 plot twists, then they just become a joke. And at the end of the day, the trick is to make the Alpha Legion feel fallible, as if they're not perfect and that everything doesn't always go to plan. Many, many, many of the short stories written about the Alpha Legion in the Horus Heresy fails miserably at this task, but Legion is not one of them. I swear, Dan Abnett is one of very, very few Black Library writers that actually understand how to write the Alpha Legion. Although occasionally even he slips up a little bit here and there, and as I mentioned, that's no dig at Dan Abnett, it's just that the Alpha Legion is so utterly balanced on a razor between being the coolest thing in the universe and utter fucking arch-typical anime trash cliché. When the Alpha Legion is good, it is some of the best stories in 40k. When they are bad, they are the end of the second season of Death Note level bad. There really is no in-between as far as the Alpha Legion is concerned. And we start right off with one of the kind of bad examples. The rather famous quote by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, War, the world's only hygiene, is attributed to Alpharius, except it's Galaxy's only hygiene. Well, it's not as bad as some of the stuff we'll eventually see, but it's certainly somewhat ham-fisted. But we shan't dwell on that for too long, as we get a couple of interesting tidbits of information quite early on in the book. One is that, apparently, some forms of low-level religion is still tolerated within the Imperium, as one of the main characters of the book, a hetman in the Gino Chiliad, is apparently a form of Catholic. Now, as with many things in 30k, they take a relatively recognizable name, like Shakespeare, and essentially change it up just a little bit, enough so that you know what they're talking about, but it still sounds like a lot of the information has been lost throughout history. For example, Egypt becomes Egyptus. And here we have a quite clear reference to some form of Catholicism, or some form of Christianity perhaps in general. Which is rather interesting, because that is definitively a religion, and we all know how Big E feels about religion. However, in this case, it seems to be somewhat specifically in regards to a specific regiment and a specific place of birth. The Chino Gilead are part of the famous 100 regiments that fought against the Emperor during the War of Unification, but that he still decided to maintain after the war, where many, many other famous regiments went the way of the Dodo and got disbanded once and for all. Being a member of such a relatively elite formation would certainly come with certain privileges, and it is very possible that the fact that the regiment is predominantly quote-unquote Catholic might simply be viewed as one of the charming peculiarities of the regiment, like a particular penchant for wearing wide-brimmed trousers or using a particular type of weaponry. And the same could be applied to this so-called religious conviction. It might, by the rest of the Imperium, simply be chalked up as an eccentricity, or indeed something the regiment keeps around for historical purposes, simply saying that, okay, the regiment was always Catholic, therefore we are going to be Catholic too, regardless of whether or not we actually understand what that means or if we actually believe in it. And it probably is an eccentricity, since throughout the book there is very little suggestion that they actually have anything that could be considered a religious conviction. 
We also get our first look at one of the Alpha Legion's troopers. He is posing to be a specialist attached to the Dino Chiliad. He's preparing an ambush and using one of their units as, well, bait, basically. He's, well, mixing in relatively well for somebody his size. Now, huge men like him within the Imperial Army is not something super abnormal. The Imperium employs quite a wide variety, in fact, of Geno-bred troops and laborers that are far, far bigger than the common man. He draws some attention to himself, especially as he's apparently also some form of specialist, but it's nothing that would really raise too many eyebrows, allowing an Alpha Legionnaire to operate relatively incognito. The fact that he chose to carry around a bolter with him is probably a far bigger tip-off. Now, again, undoubtedly the troops' first guess wouldn't be, oh yeah, he's totally Astartes, because of course, unlike in 40k, the bolt gun is not attributed any religious significance. It is not tied specifically to the Astartes. It is primarily used by the Astartes, but simply possessing one wouldn't be enough to automatically convince somebody that the guy wielding it is probably some form of Astarte. However, the trooper in question immediately decides to drop all subterfuge by pushing Hurtado Bronzi, our main character, up into a little corner while he's having a little tinkle, by the way, and tells him to not have any interesting interpretation of orders and wander out into the field where the Legionnaires are currently undergoing their own little maneuvers. Basically, he tells him to stay the fuck out of it, and when Bronzo asks him who the fuck he is and why he thinks he can boss anybody around, the Legionnaire introduced himself as fucking Alpharius. Genius level subterfuge there, dude. I am sure that is going to calm down any sort of curious itch that this particular hetman might have felt. Now, granted, the sheer weight of the name might be enough to silence him, but at the end of the day, it would be a hell of a lot less revealing if he'd simply stated he was some form of specialist attached to the army's HQ. The Alpha Legion would be more than able to fabricate the credentials associated with such a position, and they could even put traces of the position inside of the HQ's databank, more than enough to satisfy the curiosity of any Hetman. And Hetman, by the way, is basically some form of mid-ranking officer within the Geno Chiliads. Instead, our Legionnaire decides to confirm to this Hetman that not only is he Legionis Astartes, he mentions the specific Legion involved, ergo the Alpha Legion, well, due to their Primarch, and even claims to be said Primarch. Maybe he's trying to bluff the guy into sheer incredulity so he'd come up with any other explanation, but... This just seems like such a needless reveal, and as if it's made entirely for the sake of the reader to go like, Gasp, Alpharia's here? Really? I don't know, it just seems somewhat pointless to me. Also, let's talk a little bit about this everybody is Alpharius thing, because this is a thing that will continue throughout the entire book. Every single Alpha Legionnaire always introduces himself as Alpharius, and this is a part of their games of subterfuge, trying to confuse their allies as to who Alpharius really is, and letting the real Alpharius do his thing undisturbed. I kind of like this. It allows Alpharius to go undetected in places he shouldn't be able to go undetected if anybody knew he was a Primarch, and it adds to the mystique of the Legion. What I really don't like is that they apparently also mentally condition certain members of the Legion to literally believe that they are Alpharius, or indeed Omegon. Though it is unclear whether or not this is entirely sanctioned, or if the vast majority of the Legion is entirely aware that this is a thing that is going on, and honestly, it is some seriously dodgy tactics. Now, the Astartes Legions are no strangers to mental indoctrination of their legionaries, definitely not in 40k, but it seems a little bit over the top to willingly overwrite the personality of their legionaries to forcefully believe that they are Elpharius. Now, in all due likelihood, it would be a voluntary thing that they'd undergo, but the idea of just overwriting somebody's personality purely in the name of 
quote-unquote stealth seems a pretty goddamn extreme thing to me. Then again, to be entirely fair, if any Legion was going to go to that extent to preserve their secrecy, yeah, it'd be the Alpha Legion. And speaking of willing to sacrifice and all that, the Alpha Legion had devised a ploy to get around the Nerthine. They're currently embroiled in a war against a minor civilization that should have been no big deal. Their technology is several, several rungs beneath that of the Imperium. They've got crude black powder weapons, basic mortars, some very light crude machine guns, magazined rifles, and they primarily like fighting in close quarters combat with giant falxes wickedly curved giant blades that are razor sharp and apparently able to cut through practically any metal, which suggests to me that there was some foul play involved in their creation. But even if they've got really, really nice and really, really large knives, that shouldn't really be a problem. The Imperium has tanks, orbital bombardments, bomber aircraft, titans, and they tried using all of it. Except the Nerthine apparently had something that, in an outburst of pure frustration, one of the general staffers called air magic. The Nerthine were able to utilize their magic to fuck over the Imperium in absolutely ludicrous ways. An entire demi legion of titans, poof, gone. Entire bomber wings disappear above their cities without any real explanation. Orbital bombardment ineffective because they flat out can't target their goddamn cities. They tried and ended up hitting somewhere completely else, which meant they didn't try again because, well. Don't really want to orbital bombard your own dudes, now do you? And entire divisions of tanks, they drove up into the desert, then disappeared in the desert, and then got ambushed by thousands of screaming Nerthine, along with other monstrosities, that simply tore them apart. This was a rather frustrating battle, to put it mildly, and since the Imperial Commanders have no real understanding of the warp, and in this case, since there were no demon to outwardly identify as demons, they couldn't really explain what the fuck the Nerteen were doing. The Alpha Legion, however, they knew. Or, well, that's not entirely correct either. The Alpha Legion knew more about Chaos than most Imperial forces, but they didn't really understand Chaos. They quantified it. They kind of understood that, okay, if you chant these and these things in these and these orders, something is going to happen. But they didn't understand that there was some kind of vast intelligence behind all of this. Nevertheless, they knew enough that they wouldn't be able to deal with the new theme straight up. So instead, they decided to give them a nice, big, fat, juicy bait for them to ambush using their wind magic. Because whilst it allowed the Nerteen to move very, very stealthily and baffle pretty much any Imperial sensors, once they were there, <laughs> they couldn't just disengage. And so, after dangling an entire unit of the Genochilia right in front of them, the Nerteen took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. And once they were fully committed, the Alpha Legion pounced. Because you gotta remember, whilst the Alpha Legion are very, very good at subterfuge, they're no slouches at fighting, either. Oh, and one clear indication that they don't entirely understand Chaos, the Alpha Legion have adopted the Nerthine's Phalx. Granted, in the hands of a Astartes Legionnaire, it becomes a one-handed rather than a two-handed weapon, but still, they wouldn't use these if they knew everything about Chaos. Interestingly enough, though, they do understand something relating to Chaos Corruption. In fact, they go so far as to execute one of the officers of the Geno Chiliad because he had been corrupted by said chaotic influence. He had been the victim of a very large bomb and the Nerthine who had been carrying the bomb at the time of detonation. Pieces of the Nerthine's bone structure had lodged itself inside of the poor hat. He'd also started having visions of a certain haunting melody, which was, to put it mildly, somewhat suggestive and a little bit dire as well. This meant that in all due likelihood he had been, in some way, infected by chaos. Now, the Alpha Legion knew enough to identify this, but they clearly don't know enough to not use the enemy's weapons, which is a very, very goddamn bad idea, 
when you're talking about the forces of the great arch enemy. Anyways, let's move on back to that whole ambush thing. The poor Imperial Guardsmen got essentially wiped out. The handful that remained were so few and so battered that the entire formation was sent to the rear afterwards to rest and relax, something the Imperial Guard only does if you took a real proper fucking. But on the bright side, it lured out the majority of the Nerthine's forces in a major strong point, allowing the Alpha Legion to not only butcher the Nerthine in the open, but also launch a major infiltration strike on their stronghold, essentially wiping out not only the garrison, but also the entire stronghold in one sweeping strike. And considering they'd only sacrificed round about a division or so, plus supporting armor, etc., that wasn't too bad. The Imperium had been paying far, far higher prices than that on this planet for far lesser gains. Of course, the sacrificial lambs themselves didn't quite see it that way, but hey, details. Besides, this is pretty much the lot of the Imperial Guard. Or oh, actually, wait, no, excuse me. They're not the Imperial Guard yet, are they? Imperial Army. Sorry. It get surprisingly confusing once you get used to saying the one or the other. I keep catching myself talking about Astartes legions, even in relations to 40k. Anyways, with this newest victory, progress had actually been made on the goddamn planet, which was bloody fucking rare to put it very, very mildly. And apparently the Alpha Legion not only understood, but could effectively counteract the air magic of the Nurthine. Now, again, their understanding was somewhat limited, but we'll get into more details around that later. For now, happy, happy, happy. Except for some minor issues. So, the Alpha Legion. They operate in some rather fascinating ways. They like to infiltrate the various forces in the theatre that they are currently operating in. They find sympathetic personnel within the command structure of the Imperial Army, infiltrate them, recruit them, and make them their own troopers, their own agents. They also have a really, really fucking baffling habit of branding them. Essentially, they give them the brand of the Hydra, not via, you know, actual good old fire and metal or anything, but through some kind of surgical diggity da do da. They also do all kinds of interesting little operations to them, enhancing their operative capabilities, giving them various extra benefits, boosts and enhancements, so on so on. But, I mean, that's fine. They're good enough to hide these things, but the fucking brand? Really? That's got to be begging for discovery, isn't it? Every time this motherfucker takes a shower, he's at risk of giving away the entire operation. I, I don't know, the, the whole brand thing just seems amateurish for the Alpha Legion. I mean, really, not a single Legionary, you know, put their hand up and went, Excuse me, Mr. Primark person, sis. I just have to ask, why? I, I get the aesthetics, it looks cool, don't get me wrong, but isn't this begging for trouble? And wouldn't you know it, it is! <laughs> Many surprises were had this day, but that was not goddamn one of them. Apparently, a corpse had shown up, dressed in one of the unique uniforms of the Geno Chiliads. They brought the corpse back and had him identified, in which the officer immediately said, he isn't one of mine. They had also run tests and confirmed he was not one of the Geno Chiliads. This was a bit of a problem. This meant infiltration. Additionally, the man had been extensively genetically modified with all kinds of interesting dupe da -doos. And even worse, the Imperial Army High Command had absolutely no idea they had been infiltrated, and yet, clearly, they had been. This is a rather major fucking issue, to put it mildly. And somewhat suspiciously, he's got a Hydra tattoo on his buttocks. Now, at the time, they mistake it for some kind of reptilian alligator thingity bob, which is a common signal of the Nerthine. And, yeah, I can buy that. I mean, they would assume this was an enemy infiltrator, so they'd probably think of reptiles from the Nerthine before somebody would go like, hmm, Hydra, Alpha Legion, Hydra, Alpha Legion, hmm, hmm. Hmm. 
Luckily for the Alpha Legion, it all worked out anyways. They were monitoring these people to begin with, and they'd already infiltrated them to a fairly considerable degree, so they got word of the body before anyone really high up the chain of command got the word, and so they were able to make a Vox transmission ordering them to take the body and anybody who had seen it away from the compound and straight into the Alpha Legion's hands. They also tipped off the Nurthine, by the way, as to the location of this arrest and relaxation center for the Imperial Army, resulting in the massacre of pretty much everyone there. T Alpha Legion, if you didn't insist on Hydra branding you operatives, you probably wouldn't have had to murder god only knows how many thousands of Imperial soldiers just for your secrecy, and honestly, even then, I'm like, okay. I mean, they didn't know it was you. Couldn't you have intercepted this a little bit further up the chain? I, I don't know. Again, it just seems so utterly fucking callous. You could certainly make an argument for making absolutely goddamn sure, but heavens, they sure do not give much of a shit about Imperial lives, do they? And speaking of people who really don't give much of a fuck how many Imperials die, we get introduced to our first agent of the Alien Cabal, John Grammaticus, a figure we are going to be quite well acquainted with throughout the series of books. John Grammaticus is a perpetual, which means that when he dies, he doesn't really die. He's brought back to life by his masters in the Cabal, through some kind of alien mumbo-jumbo sorcery nonsense, or possibly technology. The one is not unlike the other when it relates to creatures like the Eldar and the various other nasty little griblies that make up the Cabal. The Cabal don't like humanity at all, which is kind of why, in fact, they recruit human agents to infiltrate us. They, when they first found humanity, because they are far, far older than us, decided that, hey, this is an interesting little species. They're all kinds of violent-like and explosive and horrifying, but they could be great weapons against the Primordial Annihilator, the Chaos Gods. Alternatively, they could be great weapons for the Primordial Annihilator. We should probably keep a close eye on these little fucks. They also try to influence our history and our development, but never quite managed, apparently always being thwarted somehow. I'm wondering if Big E had anything to do with that. But anyways, they try to be peaceful about it. John Grammaticus even asks, why didn't you just fucking wipe us out then? And yeah, good question. I mean, if we were going to be taking out the entire galaxy like they feared, why not just nuke us from orbit? But they were like, no, we would never do that. Back then, that is. We would totally do that now, but, well, you can defend yourselves now, so, well, too bad, I guess. Though they are currently trying to wipe out humanity, but we'll get to that a little bit later. It's a bit too early to reveal that particular plot point. We also get a couple of interesting little tidbits about the Geno 52 Chiliads. So, apparently, they've got a rather fascinating little tradition. They breed females from a certain bloodline of low-functioning psychers. Uh, John Grammaticus, by the way, is not a low-functioning psyker. He's a rather powerful psyker, although not the blasting things about kind of psyker, a far more subtle kind. The Geno 5-2 recruit these women and train them as septs, low-functioning psychers capable of communicating with their quote-unquote children in the field and impart certain information upon them. This physician within the Geno Chiliad is known as an Uxer, and as a part of becoming one, they have to have their ovaries harvested. Said ovaries are then used to grow the brunt frontline troopers of the Geno 2-5 Chiliads. The seed provided is from another form of genetically enhanced and specifically bred troopers, bred for size and skill at arms. They also continuously attribute new blood to this gene line by recruiting particularly competent officers from outside the regiment. These are then known as the hetman of the regiment. But before a female can become a full uxa, they also spend a great deal of time training under a fully-fledged uxa as septs. They boost the capabilities of the uxa 
in a communal relationship and prevent the Uxa from burning out too soon, as the strain upon them is quite severe, and generally speaking, by the time they're 30, they will all have used up all of their psychic powers, which is rather interesting. I'm wondering if, rather than using up their psychic powers, because, well, there's no such thing as using up somebody's psychic power, they simply have the part of their brain capable of utilizing it burned out in some way, as if they have been specifically genetically designed for this one purpose, but the design was not entirely perfect. And speaking of imperfections, yes, it's that time again, have some random, nonsensical ad. Now then, it should be mentioned, however, that although imperfect, this system is not bad, and in fact it is suggested by John Chromaticus that the Emperor, even in parts, stole this very system and copied it in creating his own Legiones Estates. And I have absolutely no problems in believing that. The Emperor is a wise man, and he knows when a little bit of good old-fashioned copycattery might be advantageous. Anyways, back to John Grammaticus. He is pretending to be Koenig Henneke, an Imperial spy trying to infiltrate the Nerthians' last proper bastion, their capital city, and get the Imperials whatever information he can provide them about how to best assault it, since they can't just take pictures from the air, because air magic and all of that nonsense. Now, of course, John Grammaticus is very, 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 very good at this, because that's his psychic power. Basically, he's really good at pretending to be other dudes. Though clearly not good enough. Though, granted, he is kind of getting caught here on purpose, but he gets caught by the Alpha Legion. Partially. Partially. On purpose. Because he does want to get contact with them. Granted, he would have preferred to not be caught in quite this fashion, but hey, details. The important thing was that John Grammaticus was now in direct contact with the Alpha Legion. Contact that involved a bolt gun to the back of his neck, but again, minor details that can be fixed later on. Apparently, he figured that the Alpha Legion had been messing with his head to get him to come to them. Which was well, at least partially true, if nothing else. We also have a couple extra little tidbits here. One, the Cabal had been working the Alpha Legion for a very, very long time, giving them little hints of information here and there, and making sure that when it came time for this Imperial Expeditionary Fleet to request assistance, the Alpha Legion would be the closest Astartes Legion to send help. Secondly, we also learn that the Alpha Legion do not use the word Alpharius within itself. They refer to each other by names. And quite interestingly, they also refer to each other by their given names, instead of Alpharius, around John Grammaticus. Hmm, I guess it would be really, really confusing if they kept calling each other Alpharius, but uh, maybe you should at least try to keep up the subterfuge around the stranger, but hey, I'm no expert on subterfuge. And additionally, we get to know that the Alpha Legion is very, very fond of using agents. Not only agents that they can utilize right then and there, you know, people positions within the local hierarchy, they will actually actively recruit people from pretty much every battlefield they've been on. They'll fudge their parent formation's numbers, list them as missing in action or killed in action and stuff like that, and bring them along with them. Now, mostly they prefer to recruit people with a certain talent for subterfuge or other more valuable talents like psychers, but they also recruit just regular dudes, and the Alpha Legion are pretty good guys when it comes to their recruitment pattern. If they're going to be recruiting someone from a local formation, for example, and that person would be in a whole world of shit if it ever became known that they were recruited, the Alpha Legion won't just dump them there. Whenever they can, they'll bring them along with them, making sure that they, at the very least, avoid the worst possible consequences of their quote-unquote betrayal. Now, again, of course, the Alpha Legion is absolutely no strangers to sacrifice when necessary, but if you are an agent of the Alpha Legion, then you are one of the Alpha Legion, and they will put in place a fair bit of resources to make sure they can get you out of any predicament you might have found yourself in, if for no other reason 
so that you can be sacrificed on the altar of necessity later down the line. And finally, we get a hint of just how badly the Alpha Legion has misunderstood Chaos. They have listed them as a Xenos threat, essentially putting them on the same level as stuff like the Eldar, or the Orcs, or any other just simple alien. They haven't figured out at all that they are literally warp entities and play by entirely different rules than pretty much anything in our material universe. In other words, their understanding is marginally deeper than that of many other Star Teeps chapters that do recognize demons as a thing, but they consider them to be more like a natural disaster. They happened because another thing happened in the natural order of things. The veil between the worlds weakened, and so some demons poured through. It wasn't planned, it wasn't orchestrated, and the demons themselves have no real understanding of what's going on. They're just a force of nature. The Alpha Legion has realized that they are, to some extent, intelligent, and that they are organized, in a fashion, to be hostile towards the Imperium, but they haven't figured out precisely how organized and how hostile they are. To be fair though, that's still more than most Legions have been able to piece together, so kudos to the Alpha Legion for that. Unfortunately for both the Alpha Legion and John Grammaticus, the Cabal weren't the only ones that were tracking the Alpha Legions, their comings and their goings, and of course their agents. By coming to the House of the Hydra, John Grammaticus had essentially revealed the Alpha Legion presence in the city, and led the Nerthine straight to them. A rather quick and violent chase ensued, where John Grammaticus and at least some of the Alpha Legionnaires managed to get the fuck out of Dodge, although in doing so, they roused pretty much the entire city into full-on panic mode. Now, what happened next could possibly be a part of a long-planned-out kamikaze move, essentially, where the Nerthine figured that their resistance were coming to an end and it was time to hit the fuck absolutely everything button. Alternatively, the revelation that the enemy was already in their midst might have, um, sped up preparations just a tiny little bit. Either way, the result was that they had summoned a demonic entity to try and om nom nom the Alpha Legion. And they didn't stop there, in fact, they started happily punching as many holes into the warp as they could possibly do, calling upon all manners of nasty little entities as they possessed a secret weapon, which we'll get back to once it's finally revealed in the book. Regardless, however, it was very clear that the Nerthine were up to something as, as one Imperial commander put it, the city was screaming. Firstly, the Imperials figured this was a sign of distress, as you might reasonably assume, and tried to launch a nice and quick offensive. The only problem was that a considerable portion of the units ordered to attack decided, you know what, we don't want to march into the screaming fucking city, sir. We'll be staying right here. And since there weren't any commissars around at this point in history to urge them on, they remained put. Though on that note, the Geno 5-2 Chiliads actually do have a form of proto-commissar known as Gene Whips. Apparently, there is a percentage chance of a little bit of an abnormality in the usual creation process of a Geno 5-2 Chiliad soldier that results in abnormally high IQ. These interesting little mutations are formed into a specialist... well... I want to call it a commissariat, but it's not quite. They do perform many of the same duties as a commissariat, maintaining order, discipline, and rooting out any potential problems within the formation, but they also have considerably more wide-reaching tasks beyond simply the morale and the maintenance of discipline, and occasionally the exemplification of what happens to people who don't maintain discipline. Rather, the Gene Whips also have tasks pertaining to the rather unique nature of the 5-2, where they purge unfit elements and make sure that only the fittest will stay around for any length of time and that they will of course find themselves in position of leadership. Essentially, they're trimming the bonsai tree, so to say. 
They also take a particular interest in the regiment's good reputation, as you might expect from a formation that was fighting against the Emperor and then was pardoned by him. They have a vested interest in making damn sure that nobody can ever put any kind of shit on them because, well, whilst Big E is the most generous of leaders, showing mercy twice is not generosity, that is stupidity. And speaking of stupidity, apparently Koenig Henneke, John Grammaticus, has managed to sneak his happy little winky down into the panties of one of the Gino Chiliad Uxors, and is currently having her hide him from the authorities. That is some hentai level brain fuckage right there, considering <laughs> how interested the Chiliad are in keeping a nice and clean house. That is an impressive display of the way of the winky. Then again, he has been alive for thousands of years and, oh, God Emperor only knows what kind of enchantments the Eldar put in his pants. I certainly wouldn't put that past the twisted little fucks. Despite his lovey-dovey manipulations, however, Beemoth started getting really, really suspicious that something was going on. The Lord Commander had a bodyguard of the famed Lucifer Blacks, which at this point in time were still really good at what they did. They were considerably better than the 40k variants. Lucifer Blacks still do exist in 40k, although they're nowhere near as good. Their bloodline has been thinned out rather considerably. They're still elite troops, but these guys... These guys were something different. They are recruited from the most disturbed, violent individuals in the galaxy, and they are then broken and trained in the arts of security. They are remarkably good at keeping their charges safe. And they had got a little bit of a whiff of what John Grammaticus was doing. They'd also really started suspecting the Alpha Legion for obvious goddamn reasons, considering they had already carried out at least one major operation behind the Lord Commander's back, something he wasn't too fond of. The Alpha Legion would now officially introduce themselves to the expedition in a little bit of a ceremony. The Primarch himself would come down and shake hands and be jovial and convivial and all of that. And the sheer brass balls on the bastards. They bring Omegon, one of the two of the twin Primarchs, right down there into the Lord Commander's presence and introduce him as, oh, you yeah, know, he's, he's just a regular trooper, don't worry about him. <laughs> Again, I feel like the Thousand Sons might have had a, a bit of an issue with overconfidence, but the Alpha Legion can't be all that far behind. They know, after all, that the Lord Commander's bodyguard are Lucifer Blacks, and they also think that... No, no, he isn't the regular trooper. Hell, he's the same size as the Primarch, which... Yet think be a pretty big giveaway? Now granted, there are individual Astartes that can be really, really goddamn big. There's of course, you know, variations in size, etc. between them, but Primarch big? That's pretty rare. To make matters even more complicated, turns out that their attempt to wipe out what remained of the Geno 52 Chiliads at the Reston Restoration Camp didn't work out. Now, most of them died, but about eight or so survived, and the worst part is that one of the survivors knew about the corpse, the one with the Alpha Legion brand on it, and he was starting to get mighty suspicious. The Alpha Legion had been in system for, what, a month or so, and stuff was already starting to fray a little bit at the edges. Oh, and also, a less important, though odd aside, so how I do these things is first I read the book, then I kind of let that stow in my mind for a week or so, and then when I'm ready to record the video, I then record the video whilst listening to the audiobook version while playing some random half-assed game. It's a real nice reminder and it also gives me time to think about the peculiarities and the important things in the books. I didn't notice this in the book, which got me really confused when I got to it in the audiobook, but apparently one of the chief Uxas at the recipial ceremony for Alpharius was wearing a red burqa? I 
can't remember that from the book and it seems like something that would leap out at me. But apparently, um, one of them was wearing a burqa, which is really, really goddamn out of place. The burqa is a religious piece of clothing, very, very much so. It'd be just as strange as having a random Imperial commander wearing a cross or something. And I very much so doubt it's got anything with their heritage to do, since everything that we've heard about the Geno 52 Chiliad so far, pretty much none of it suggests any kind of Middle Eastern or Islamic influence. Hell, one of them is apparently some kind of pseudo-Catholic. And as for their ranks, well, we have Hetman, that's a Eastern European thing, and Uxa originates from Latin, and was later taken up in the English language and meant to use wife. None of this really suggests Middle Eastern in any way. It's just a really, really weird outfit for a Chief Uxa to be wearing. But we'll move on from the space burqa and onto something far more inflammatory, so... It would appear that the Alpha Legion is pretty damn woke when it comes to the Imperium. They think that a utopian ideal of heading towards the perfect society is not only pointless, but also downright detrimental and dangerous for any society or group to be heading towards. In other words, chasing an utopian ideal will never work out because it is being carried out by imperfect beings, therefore the ideal of perfection can never be achieved. And yes, that is entirely correct. The utopian ideal is dangerous simply because if you have a greater good, hell, I made an entire political video on this, but if you have a greater good, then by definition, anything you do in the name of that greater good will be justified, no matter how heinous the act may be. Killing people will by definition be justified if it is in the name of the greater good. Persecuting people will by definition be justified because it is in the name of the greater good, etc, etc, etc. We have seen this time and time again throughout human history, but this is said in a very specific context. The Alpha Legion is talking about this with the Lord Commander in reference to the Emperor's plans to reunite the galaxy and create the quote-unquote perfect society. Now, they also hasten to point out that it is fine and dandy, well and good and perfect to look at the perfect world and measure your world against that. Basically, what you're doing is, okay, this is the perfect solution. This is how everything would be if everything was flower and puppies and everything was good and wonderful. How close can I get to that solution without compromising my own ideals and values? And it seems as if that is what the Alpha Legion thinks the Emperor is doing, but they say it in a fashion that <laughs> is very, very easy to misunderstand, and the Lord General himself kind of does. He's like, are you questioning the Emperor's grand design? And they're like, no, 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 totally not. We're just trying to explain this in a philosophical sense, which is really interesting. Because to arrive at this conclusion, they must have looked at the Emperor's grand design with a critical eye. And remember, the Emperor is to these people a de facto god. They don't call him as such, and hell, they even ridicule those who do, but to them, he is a perfect being. And therefore, he is the utopian ideal. Or in other words, the Emperor is the greater good. And since the greater good is the greater good, it must, by definition, be perfect, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to justify doing anything and everything to achieve it. It's a wonderful piece of circular logic, the whole greater good thing, isn't it? It really is quite fascinating. Anyways, let's move on from the philosophical waffle and on to the actual point of this. This means that the Alpha Legion is surprisingly independent. Now, of course, being a very undercover force, this would make sense, but nevertheless, they seem to have... How do I... how do I put this? Broken the spell of the Emperor. Or to put it in perhaps a slightly more obvious way, they don't see him as THE Emperor, they see him as the Emperor. He's a guy, he's their leader, and he is by far the best amongst them, but at the end of the day, he's still just a man. 
Now, of course, we could launch into a whole discussion about whether or not the Emperor is actually just a man, considering his powers, but that, of course, isn't actually the point here. The point is, the Alpha Legion seems to have thought a lot more about the Emperor and his goals than any other Legion, and they seem to have adopted a far more realistic stance towards him and his plans than the other Legions. That is not to say that they are not loyal, however. In fact, I think that might actually make them one of the most loyal legions to the Emperor's ideals, rather than the Emperor himself, and that is the important distinction. The Alpha Legion is loyal to the Emperor's ideas, not necessarily to the Emperor. We'll get a bit deeper into those ideals later on in the book because it'll become very, very relevant indeed, but I think it is important to point out these differences as we get across them because it's very clear that the Alpha Legion are very, very different than the rest of the Legioni Sestatis. Not just in how they fight, how they behave, or how they deploy themselves, but in how they think about their role within the Imperium, and hell, even about the Imperium as a whole, they are very, very unique. I also really love how they explain their stealth in this book. Instead of simply just being massive, heavily armored ninjas that sneak around, they stealth in a far more intelligent way, and far more reasonable for a space marine. We have a scene where Omegon is simply just wandering through the Imperial Security Force's laser detection grid because the Alpha Legion owns that grid. They have infiltrated and hacked it to such an extent that they don't sneak around the security grid, they simply walk right through it which is a much better way of doing Asati stealth than pretending that somehow these fuckers can sneak. At the very least, without the aid of some half-understood psychic powers like the Raven Guard use. Anyways, the Alpha Legion talk with the Lord Commander, explaining to him how chaos works in the most ridiculously simplistic fashion possible, and they seem to think they know quite a lot. They're talking about warding measures and using psychic powers against the forces of chaos, which isn't necessarily wrong, mind you. It is just potentially, fatally, lacking in subtlety and nuance. Whilst all of this is going on, John Grammaticus is up to his usual no-goodery. He does get kind of caught by one of the Lucifer Blacks, a Lucifer Black that he then kills barehanded, so... <laughs> clearly, whatever the Eldar did to him, it went beyond enhancing his winky. Apparently, they did something pretty interesting to his entire body when they resurrected him. Because, well, he just, unarmed and unarmored, defeated a Lucifer Black, fully armed and fully armored, in a fistfight, whilst not setting off a single goddamn alarm. <laughs> John Chromaticus is very, very good at what he does. Too bad, then, that his alien masters don't really seem to appreciate him. After having dragged his heavily wounded body away from this place relatively safely, one of his original saviors, in fact, THE original savior, an Eldar Autark of all bloody things, shows up on Earth and tells him just how important this shit is, in case, I assume, Grammaticus forgot. I'm a little bit confused about exactly how much the Cabal told him, because they talk as if they showed him what was going to happen, as if they showed him, you know, everything that's gonna go bad, etc, etc, and it made it sound like he was very well informed about what was going to happen, the whole heresy. And yet here is this Autark going like, no, John, you don't understand. You actually have to do this because if not, Horus is going to turn into a crazy person and kill absolutely everything, everywhere. And that would be bad. They are also... I'm kind of thinking contradicting themselves here, otherwise I am misunderstanding something really badly because at the end they tell the Alpha Legion that they want Horus to win the war so quickly and so overwhelmingly that it's just done. Horus will eventually go mad, realizing what he's done, realizing how he's introduced chaos to the world, and start a second civil war which will wipe out humanity. And yet here they are saying 
that they need to avoid the death of the Emperor at all costs, his final death at all costs. Which, okay, how do those two work out? Do they consider his deathless state upon the throne to be his quote-unquote final death? I don't get it. And apparently, it has to be the Alpha Legion. They've tried all of the other legions. They started with the Dark Angels, but, well, considering their home planet, yeah. That's not going to work out particularly well. The Alpha Legion being the newest and the least corrupted, quote-unquote, apparently the gene seed flaws have something to do with corruption as well, which is interesting because in later books, even demons make it sound like it is primarily a biological problem rather than a warp problem. It's getting kind of difficult to tell, but considering just how long and massive this book series is, you kind of have to excuse a little bit of confusion on the part of the various authors, etc., don't you? I'm thinking that there's simply just been some, you know, lack of communication back and forth. Alternatively, you know, there could simply be lies going around or simple misinformation. Perhaps the various parties that claim they know simply don't know, or perhaps they're simply just bullshitting. Either one is entirely possible. Anyways, I'll pick this up in the next episode. So until then, I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.